So there's a question of um, the radical presupposition of a habitus in breaking in as the why. So the absconding of the why in the age of the world picture. So we've been looking at the um, chapter seven of Dostoevsky and uh, Strauss's introduction to the Spinoza book. I'm going to be somewhat even more um, as part of my uh, habitus. Already, I'm often pretty expressionistic and not um, systematic or straightforward. Um, I think I'm maybe a little more. Um, so this time, but it's just um, how it is. So uh, let's just give it a try. Um, I was thinking, I was a little bit excited in the last uh, one over uh, the Zizek comments, and um, I said some things which weren't quite right about the anthropologist Ellen McFarlane, but it's got me to thinking... Um, what is his interest in philosophy? How does that connect up to the issues that we're dealing with, with um, Strauss, Dostoevsky, Heidegger, and so forth? So he makes a great praise of um, a book called The Mediterranean World and the Mediterranean um, in the Age of Philip II by um, Rodell, but he detracts from that praise by saying, here we have a picture of the tides and flows of a whole world, but it's not put into a philosophic methodology so we know about the why of it. It has uh, the character of the painting of an old master or of something which astonishes us in its um, sh showing forth, um, it does not tell us, it leaves out um, ourselves. So art as the art of empiricism is this experiencing which attempts to leave us out. Um, so Strauss is saying here, for instance, I experience a tree. In doing so, I'm not necessarily aware of my quote-unquote ego, which is the condition of possibility of my experiencing anything. So this whole question of uh, these philosophies, since Kant, of the um, conditions of any possible experience, or I should say, um, more properly, since Descartes unearthed that almost um, accidentally, this question of the ego as a substance back behind any experience as a presupposition. If you give the ego a content, then it becomes a prejudice, a habitus, it becomes a um, something that biases our actions. This theme is coming up also in the seventh uh, chapter. So Dostoevsky is saying, you saw no distinction in beauty between some brutal, obscene action and a great exploit, even the sacrifice of life for the good of humanity. Um, I'm reminded of um, Stockhausen, the uh, musician who got into some trouble by speaking of the devil's art um, at the time of 9-11 and 
making a praise of that. Um, if empirical science removes any prejudice or presupposition, any um, formation of the human being back behind the experience, um, important example here is Strauss is raising the example of the possibility of Jewish life based on the presupposition of the law. You suppose a why for any experience or for any science presuppose it that you're so for instance in philosophy there's a general background presupposition that philosophy is supposed to be in some way good or helpful to human beings. This is what um, that's we're less aware of that today because of the intervening time between um, see Nietzsche or so and ourselves. Nietzsche was still thick in this awareness so that it was um, something shocking when he discovered that you could um, do without that in a way that you could um, not make this distinction between this uh, so-called brutal um, obscene action and the noble action that we could totally abstract ourselves and, and come into the world picture as Heidegger's calling it felt built think of these problems like the uh, burdens uh, ass the problem of the donkey which can't decide um, under conditions of instrumental rationality or um, rationality which is only programmed to consider the solution of some problem rather than the background habitus or the um, disposition of the one making the inquiry. If we have this disposition that we want to help human beings, um, our experience presumably pushes us in a different direction. So I was thinking of this, this is a word eigenlich in German. It's a word that kind of breaks in um, so far as I can tell. The German is quite poor, but um, you know, eigenlich kite is Heidegger's word for which takes over from the Kantian um, autonomy. Uh, Zizek understands it as corruption, as it were. So there's Dasman, and then there's this, everyone is corrupted in their own particular way. Um, Heidegger understands it as um, not confusing oneself with anyone else. So the conditions were not being able to confuse oneself with someone else. So he had a lot of his problems with Husserl had to do with that. He had a particular path that he had to follow in order not to confuse himself with anyone else. And he couldn't stay with uh, Husserl's philosophy, um, which Husserl took some uh, tifa, some deep umbrage over because Suso really wanted a brilliant um, protege to continue his, his work. Um, in a conversation, if one is talking to somebody for some time and uh, then remembers that they don't know that person's name, they can say Eigenlisch, as though to say um, but actually, I don't uh, know your name. They break into the course of the, the flow of things with this, this which is forming in their, the background of their um, disposition that they want to know the name, that they need to break into the course of the experienced flow of things. I think the best, after considering the, the use of Eigenlisch in, in daily speech, I think that the best uh, use and connection to Heidegger would be to say Eigenlisch means actuality. So 
actuality in Aristotle, although I don't, I think it's overemphasized um, how important Aristotle is for Heidegger in the general discussion. Although, of course, Heidegger does make remarks like, for the first 25 years, study Aristotle. Um, but nonetheless, he, he says this in the context of pushing back towards Plato, towards the seventh letter especially, and then pushing back towards the so-called first inception or first beginning with the um, pre-Platonics or pre-Socratics, and towards, as it were, within himself, um, he wants to say this eigenlish, this, um, but actually this breaking in, which would allow him to go towards the, the, the new inception or the new beginning. Um, so McFarlane is saying the problem with uh, Rodell, who, is, who has this beautiful image of the whole intricate uh, world of the Mediterranean in the time of Philip II, he has no, there's, there's no systematic uh, philosophy behind it like a Montesquieu or so who tells you what it's all about, what the motive of it is, what what, how to put this into a, a a science of history which would tell us what we're doing here. Why are we studying this? Is it just um, this sui generis artwork which flashes before us, uh, glittering in a way, and then um, we have to fill in some Leopardi or Nietzsche? Um, fairy tale or um, sing ourselves um, to sleep somehow. Um, so I think that what Heidegger is insisting upon is that if we stay with the world image without the why, there's always a why in our disposition anyway. So therefore you should embrace that and that between this why of our disposition, our habitus, this is just one way of stating it, one way of um, uh, giving ourselves a, a, a protreptic, as it were, sort of setting ourselves a, a why or a motive by persuading ourselves or instructing ourselves on um, how to think about what Heidegger is doing and these problems which are wouldn't be interesting if they were simply about Heidegger but because Dostoevsky has already come across them because Strauss has already come across them because they've already been at the heart of um, world movements because of the rise of science because these are problems that are um, in the flow and tide of um, the being that we're being carried along in. Um, you know, this This is part of Heidegger's claim is that what he observes in his researches are things that um, in a certain way are not just fantasies but must be observed. So somehow that we must observe that the why is there but then what he does is focus on the motion between the why and the world picture. Um, there's a tree, as Strauss is saying, but I forget the precept. I don't, do I need to bring in this presupposition of the subject? Um, Nishatini, there's this, I think Nishatini might have been biased in some way by Heidegger in saying this. Nishatini comes out and says, well, Descartes has this presupposition of the subject. Well, okay, but then it strikes to me that if you don't have the presupposition of the stu subject, then one can say, well, you have the presupposition, motive, disposition of ignoring the subject, which is just another presupposition. Once we're conscious of the issue of presupposition, why, uh, bias, um, uh, for Ertile, um, prejudgment, and so on, then we see, as Strauss admits in, in Nietzsche, that there must be some kind of, uh, and I think Hayek would admit it too, there must be some kind of presupposition. 
but presupposition is not the same thing as calculative rationality, which says um, this end will be achieved necessarily. We know this end will be achieved necessarily. We follow these steps. It's different. It's it's um, in fact it might not bring about any. Uh, even though we say philosophy is trying to help human beings, maybe it won't help human beings at all, but it's part of our motive, perhaps, or it was part of the Greek motive. The Greeks probably, um, it was granted them to accept that because they had largely no notion that the truth could be, um, as Nietzsche put it, deadly. Once you consider that the truth could actually be deadly to human beings, then you get this transformation where you wonder whether you should still be doing philosophy. Um, it's interesting that the notion of a prejudice, which is uh, in Nietzsche, um, this for Ertile. Uh, where Ertile means an ordeal, like a legal ordeal. Think of Kafka a little bit. And uh, prejudice, the English word, just, uh, so pre-justice. Um, these make us think of the law, and Strauss is saying the law is the background presupposition operative in Jewish thought until we get to modernity. And then people start saying, well, why are you having these prejudicial presuppositions? You should just be empirical. You should just look at the world picture. So this is, um, this is a very large and long, uh, question here, but um, just wanted to open it up a little bit and give us a chance to move towards it, also in the context of the, the investigations we've been making already with um, Strauss and Dostoevsky.